Good evening. My name is Andrea Barnwell Brownlee, and I am the director and CEO of the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens. Welcome to Litter Archer. You know, 111 people have registered for this important conversation, and I'm so happy to be with you all tonight. It's my real, real sincere pleasure to welcome so many of you. I know we have some people that have been here on many occasions and we have some first time visitors as well. But uh, all I can say is you're in for an extraordinary treat. So as you all know, this is an incredible and important virtual series. Litter Archer is both a book club and an art club and explores coping with this crazy pandemic. Cindy Edelman is an art lecturer and Stacey Goldring is the author offering perspective and solace at this moment as well as refuge within the pages of books and painted artworks. The Cummer Museum is so privileged and proud of this partnership. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to let you all know that if you would like additional information, you can certainly click the link that um, Emily has so graciously included in the, uh, the chat. And um, we look forward to our conversation. So again, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Cindy and Stacey. Thank you, Andrea. Good evening, everybody. I wish we were all together in the Cummer Museum, but alas, the pandemic has prevented that. We, I want to welcome you to Litter Archer's third presentation in our Cummer series. Tonight, we're straying from coping with COVID and 19th century British art and literature. And we're sharing our uh, Holocaust Remembrance presentation. Tonight's topic is Stolen Yet Found, Remembering the Holocaust Through Photography and Poetry. Before we get started, Stacy and I thought it would be worthwhile to share some thoughts about our entry into tonight's topic. Why have we both separately and together lectured and taught for years on Holocaust art and literature? What is it in our DNA? Let's don't ask our husband, Stacy. What is it in our DNA that speaks to us about one of the most horrific times in our people's history? What drives me to collect Holocaust art? I didn't grow up in a home that lost immediate family members. However, when I was 12, there was a confluence of factors. A very, very dear Sunday school teacher, teacher Gerda Schwartz of blessed memory, whose tattooed arm prompted many questions. Further, my first reading of the diary of Anne Frank was about the same time and that combined with a very graphic Holocaust documentary film called Let My People Go, which showed uh, skeletons in wheelbarrows, lots of skeletons piled high. And that made, an, the, both of those made indelible impressions. And finally, my rabbi, Rabbi James Wax, I've spoken about him many times. Um, he was the one who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King and the garbage strikers in Memphis where we grew up. Um, he had been to Europe and he had seen some of the concentration camps. And as you can imagine, the experience informed his sermons, including his quest that we live a life in service of those less fortunate. And that really made a deep impression on me and my two sisters imbuing in us a strong strain of social justice, which has remained. Next, please. Memory, art, individual and collective responses. Each one of those descriptors relates to the hero of tonight's Holocaust art story. The man you see on the screen, Henrik Ross, uh, whose, uh, whose quote, uh, just hints at his indomitable spirit and sheer will. I don't know, can, can everybody read the quote because it looks like we're covering the quote. Okay, um, Ross's contribution to the understanding of the Holocaust includes one of the largest and mo most complete records of life as a Nazi captive in the 1940s through pictures and firsthand accounts. 
And by sharing his story and his photographs, we honor his memory and literally the thousands and thousands he photographed on this belated commemoration of Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah. Shoah in Hebrew translates or means catastrophe or utter destruction. And it refers to the atrocities that were committed against the Jewish people by Hitler, the Nazis, and um, uh, their numerous collaborators during World War II. Shoah, also known as the Holocaust, Holocaust uh, is a Greek word meaning sacrifice by fire or burnt whole. So the Holocaust was the largest expression of anti-Semitism in recent history. I will, I will, as on, as an aside, you know, we've certainly been experiencing plenty of uh, anti-Semitism in this country recently, but that's saved for another time. Yom HaShoah reminds us of the horrors that Jews and other persecuted groups faced. Forced labor, starvation, humiliation, diseases, torture, often resulting in death. The Holocaust was a total systematic genocidal effort to wipe out an entire population from the face of the earth. We're going to see the impact of the Shoah on Henrik Ross. He and his wife, Stefania, were among the lucky ones. They were the rare survivors of four years in hell and not one of the six million who were brutally wiped out. His life, his survival, and the subsequent uh, images are nothing short of miraculous. And his place in history, uh, the photos we're examining, played a major role in the conviction of one of the most notorious criminals, the infamous Adolf Eichmann. Next, please. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, in September of 1939, Henrik Ross was one of more than 3 million Polish Jews. Um, our, our story or his story uh, took place in Ludz. Now it's spelled L-O-D-Z, Ludz, but in, in Polish it's pronounced Wudz and in Yiddish Ludz. And I'm going to stick with the Yiddish tonight. Ludz was uh, 75 miles southwest of Warsaw and it was the textile capital of Poland. Um, in early 1940, uh, the Nazis uh, set up a ghetto in Ludz, rounding up about 164,000 Jews, uh, which was more than a third of the city's entire population. And it forced them into the industrial part of the industrial section of the industrial part of the city, which was about 1.6 square miles space. So 164,000 crammed into this you know, very um, unspeakable uh, space and appalling conditions. And, and it was specifically intended, ghettos were set up by the Nazis specifically intended to isolate and seclude them from the rest of the population. And as I said, uh, these conditions were just dreadful. They were unspeakable, no running water, no sewage system, um, overcrowded conditions, eight to 10 people in a room, um, hard labor, and of course, starvation. Uh, it was del deliberate starvation. In fact, in Ludge, 20% of the prisoners died of starvation, and that's from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, research. So you're looking at on the left, uh, one of the largest synagogues in Ludge. There were seven uh, large synagogues and hundreds of smaller prayer houses. This synagogue was built in 1861. You know, when I think, when I hear 1861, I think about the Civil War, but this gorgeous synagogue was being built in Poland. This was the oldest, the Stara, and the Nazis burned it to the ground almost exactly a year after Kristallnacht. So November of 1939 was when this synagogue was destroyed. And so we, we look, we're fortunate that we have this photo of it because you'll notice the horseshoe, ar horseshoe arches um, and the striped or banded marble on the facade is reminiscent of Sephardic synagogue architecture called Moorish Revival, which really is inspired by ancient um, Islamic art that had made it to Spain, um, ancient Spain, 
as well as some Indo-Asian uh, uh, styles. And then of course, you see the rubble of, uh, of the synagogue. All the synagogues were destroyed um, at that time. Next, please. So here's the, um, here are two identification cards of our hero, Henrik Ross. You'll notice that the one on the left is from 1938 before he entered the ghetto. And then on the right, three years later, 1941, after he had been there a year. And Henrik Ross was born in Warsaw in 1910. And he worked in Ludge as a sports and press uh, photographer before World War II. He arrived in the ghetto when he was around 30 years of age with his camera, which was originally confiscated because uh, the Nazis had banned Jews from even taking photographs. But he was very skilled and he was a professional, you know, he's a professional photographer. So um, we'll, we'll soon see some images where we'll soon see that he was uh, hired or um, placed into uh, labor to, to be an official photographer of the ghetto. I, I wanna just uh, make, uh, ask you all a question. Can you see the difference three years make in, um, in the photos of Mr. Ross uh, in terms of his face and in terms of the gauntness and the weight loss? By the end of um, 1944, he, he shed 85 pounds, you know, from life in the ghetto. Next, please. In all ghettos, the Nazis, uh, with their typical cruelty, formed Jewish councils. That is, Jews who lived within the ghetto, who saw, oversaw the ghetto community on behalf of the city's German food and economy office, ghetto division, these councils were called Judenrat, and Jews ran the ghetto. They had their own police. They had their own fire brigade. They had their own currency. Of course, it was totally um, useless uh, and worthless. And they had a post office. On the left slide, of, uh, you see a stamp uh, that has the head of the elder of the Judenrat, the man who was in charge, and his name is uh, is uh, below, Chaim Mordecai Rumkowski. And we're gonna talk about him a little bit later, uh, but he was the person who worked with uh, his Nazi counterpart, who was named Hans Bieboff, who you see in the slide on the right, on the uh, photograph on the right. And um, Rumkowski, uh, the Jewish elder of the Judenrat, devised this theory, uh, which was that if he made the ghetto as productive as possible, that Jews would have a greater chance of survival and had a slogan, which was, quote, our only path to survival is through work. And um, the moral dilemmas here of leading a Judenrat or working with the Nazis were akin to basically dealing with the devil, because in the end, 95% who lived in the ghettos either died in the ghetto or were shipped in a cattle car to places like Auschwitz. So um, he, his existence, his, it was, he, he was, uh, a he was just uh, a very tortured uh, soul. Next, please. So here you see Ross, and he was uh, taking a photo, he was taking identity card uh, photos of, for, of Jews. And he was hired to be an official staff photographer within, you'll love this, the Jewish Statistics Office, which was part of the Judenrat and which meant that people who worked for them uh, received extra rations, especially, you know, watered down soup. Um, and there was another young Jewish photographer named Mendel Grossman who also uh, worked with Ross. And they both took official Nazi photos, documented industrial pro productivity of the Jewish labor and uh, photos like you see on the screen. And what's interesting is in these capacities, they had access to extra film and uh, the processing facilities within the Ludge ghetto. And in this Ross uh, photograph, uh, you see that um, he's, he's just so clever because he 
built these platforms with dividers so that he could save his film because what he did was he would take a photo, one photo of, of, of I don't, I don't uh, what do we see? Like at least seven, eight, nine, at least 10, at least 10 um, people here. And then he would cut them up. So he didn't have to use all his, his entire roll of 35 millimeter film. And he could stock, he could stockpile the film to take more unsanctioned photos. So he perfected a technique of taking photos that he would have been killed if he had been caught. And if we were together, I would have worn a trench coat because I've seen documentary, uh, a documentary film of Ross where he's wearing this, he's got his camera around his neck and he's wearing a trench coat. And he has a, a someone who uh, is uh, looking out for uh, police or Nazis. Uh, and what he does is he quickly determines what he's going to shoot, opens his coat, takes the photo and quickly shuts the coat. So he, you know, he did that quite a bit and you're going to see uh, some examples momentarily. And his wife was one of his lookouts. And so he really, he began as an act of resistance. He began documenting uh, Jewish life in particular, the indignities that Jews were subjected to, beatings, uh, hangings, uh, dead lying in the streets, uh, dead in their beds, uh, other horrific scenes. Um, and he also uh, photographed Jews who were the beneficiary, beneficiaries of special favors, people like himself. And the overarching message here is that he wanted to bring a comprehensive account to his work no matter the cost to, to himself or to his wife. He, they didn't have children until much later. He wanted to defy the Nazis and he was really willing to die for it. I mean, he was really, he was willing to take that risk and he, he, he had to have been just so lucky. He had, had to have had some better angels on his uh, shoulders. Now the next couple of, uh, next please, dear Hannah. The next uh, slides are, uh, are propaganda shots made by Ross. There were about a hundred factories in the ghetto and Jews were forced into slave labor. They made uh, boots for the German army and uniforms um, and they made mattresses. And they, the mattresses were filled with wood shavings that were so fine, they were as fine as wool. And here you see some of the um, uh, women uh, making uh, the covers for the mattresses. Okay, and, if, and we're gonna just uh, flip through the next couple, if you would, thank you. And here you have the textile uh, department. I've, I, honestly, I've never seen so many men at a sewing machine. You know, I'm sure none of us have. And some, and I was reading that some of these men were, you know, professional uh, attorneys and other uh, professional uh, jobs that uh, accountants and so forth. And, you know, they, they, they were put to work and it didn't matter if they didn't know how to sew, they learned very quickly. And these photos were supposed to show how orderly the productivity was. And then the next slide is um, men hauling bread. And Ross, Ross said about this quote, we received a loaf of bread for eight days. That's like eight to 10 people in one room. They received a loaf of bread for eight days. Apart from this, there were food rations in small quantities, which sometimes were rotten. You know, sometimes they were fed frozen cabbage that was just perfectly, you know, miserable, dreadful. And he goes on to say, those who worked received an extra ration of soup, but it was 95% water. And he goes on to say, people, people either swelled up from hunger or became emaciated. And um, it's just, you know, it was just a very, very difficult uh, living conditions, excuse me. Next, please. But Ross also took thousands. I mean, you know, we, you'll, we're going at the end of, near the end of our conversation tonight, you'll learn that he took 6,000 images. Um, and so he took thousands of photos that were unofficial photos that commemorated life in the ghetto, including his own marriage in 1941 that you see on the screen where the bride and groom stand under a chuppah um, surrounded by friends and loving, uh, you know, loving people. 
Um, he managed to find beauty in calm moments, even amidst the suffering and capturing those moments whenever he had an opportunity. And if you'll go to the next one, this is an example of the contact sheet of some of his photos that show the joy and the love and the normalcy that you know people craved when they were having to be to having to endure this kind of these kind of conditions that were that were just heinous. They were horrible. But you see some a young girl reading a book, and you see couples, and you see mothers and babies, uh, and you see families gathered together, generations. And so um, everything in these studies of uh, children playing and families celebrating special occasions to couples in love. And, and here's what's striking about these, that these figures are endowed with uh, grace, uh, they're endowed with dignity and self-worth. And, you know, again, he, if he had gotten, if he had been caught uh, taking any of these, he would have been, his camera would have been, that would have been the end of him and uh, his, his, his family. Can we go please to the next? Um, according to Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Rem Remembrance Center, the people like you see in this particular slide, uh, in these pictures smile, you know, they're handsome and they're very well dressed and they seem healthy and happy but taken in the hell that we know was Ludge, it is hard to believe that the pictures were, you know, like this were possible. They, they don't reconcile with the environment in which they, um, uh, they were taken. And they're truly deceptive. Uh, they make it seem as though the conditions in the ghetto hadn't been so bad. Um, if these well-fed, well-dressed, healthy and happy people were, um, were joyful. I think it's important to point out that these photographs stand in stark contrast to the reality that the majority of the ghetto inmates faced. And there are many unanswered questions for us. Uh, for, for instance, the question, why? Why did Ross take these? I think I've really taken a, made a stab at answering that. But you know, did he take them for friends? It's possible. Did he take them for money? Well, I don't know, we don't know that. Um, perhaps they were a way of recording one's dignity. That seems a really strong possibility. We'll never know. But we do know that our job is not to judge Henrik Ross because like all other victims, he did the best he could under the terrible circumstances he was forced to endure. <coughs> Excuse me, um, next please. Here's that intimate moment that he caught on film. And then the next. And here's an example of um, a festive occasion. And Stacy and I have gone back and forth about what was being celebrated. You know, first we thought maybe it was Shabbat, but then um, we both are not the best. We don't Beth, we both don't possess the best eyesight. So we were we were really straining and we saw that there were at least three, maybe four candles. So I'm going with Hanukkah. Now thus far, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Thus far we've seen images of German propaganda, scenes of how ghetto privileged lived. And now we're going to see some of the raw images. Um, many of them speak for themselves, but let's go to the next. Um, and this one, uh, this one's really hard to, um, to talk about. Uh, women and men removing feces from the ghetto. You know, at the same time that Ross was taking some of his other photos, he, he secretly documented the grim realities of life in Ludge. Whereas the war, as the war progressed, things, living conditions went from bad to worse. <coughs> Excuse me. Here you're seeing the ghettos, fecal workers charged with pulling carts uh, that held barrels of human excrement. This was an incredibly dangerous job um, because pushing the carts that move feces out of the ghetto often led to death by typhus and many other fatal diseases. And, you know, it just, 
it's so horrific. And if you look at the feet of the women in the front of this wagon, you'll see the, the figure on the far um, on, on the far end away from us, it only has one shoe. And the woman in the foreground is her feet are wrapped in rags. And you can only imagine, you know, just the enormity and the burden of this of this task uh, and the danger and 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 the, this, just everything. It was uh, some of these, um, you know, some of these tasks are just too too tough to um, to imagine. And this this actually speaks for itself. Let's go to the next, please. By um, January uh, 1942, uh, the uh, Germans started deportations to a uh, camp about 30 miles from Ludge, and it was called Shelmano. And Shelmano, uh, the means of extermination were uh, vans that were uh, that had that were uh, had gas. So. Uh, uh, this is this photo uh, that Ross took shows a mother and two sons uh, who were separated. One, uh, uh, it, is, it is my understanding from the research that I did that the mother was being deported first and then the two boys later. And you can only imagine if you're a mother and you're looking at this barbed wire fence and these are the last words that you know you're going to be uh, saying to your children the last time you'll see them. It is uh, one of the most poignant uh, of images that, uh, that he took. And uh, it, it's especially the way the, the hands of the young boys are reaching up to, you know, reaching up and out toward their mother. Her hands are grasping the fence. And I noticed too, after looking at this so many times, the, there's a man standing beside her with you know, uh, a hat, uh, and I presuming, presuming it's a man. Um, Ross testified that uh, in the year 1940, it was still not known where the transports were going to. But in 1941, at the time of further deportations, the Jews began to make inquiries and it became known to them that they were going into the quote, frying pan. This was a routine expression of the people in the ghetto. They knew, they knew they were going to be burned and they used to call it going into the frying pan. And as Stacy so lovingly reminded me the other day that this is what happens when we don't stand up to bullies or when we don't stand up to liars or we don't stand up to injustice when we hear it or when we see it. Next, uh, please. Uh, so this particular image of children being driven to Shalmano to their deaths is so painful to describe uh, as it represents evil in all of its forms. Uh, in 1942, uh, Nazis demanded that Mr. Romkowski, the elder of Ludge, uh, arrange for the deportation of 20,000 children, elderly and sick, to, Shel to Shelmano. And he, he did this in a manner that has really marked him uh, for, for eternity, if you will. He delivered a speech called, Give Me Your Children. I mean, he, he apparently had, uh, uh, the, the Nazis had come in and they said they want they want they needed 20,000 uh, children sick and elderly and people ignored it. And so they forced uh, Romkowski to make this uh, speech uh, and to uh, help uh, go into their homes and pull them out and throw them on either uh, wagons like this or in cattle cars. They were taken to Shelmano. Uh, they were immediately gassed in vans. And this number included every child under 10 years of age. And there were about 6,000, slightly less than 6,000 of them. It's just incomprehensible. Uh, and in the summer of 1944, 
Rumkowski and his family were on the last transport to Auschwitz from Ludge. And when, when the Ludge group got off the train, Ludge inmates who had survived up to that point were waiting for him. And soon after he was, uh, after he arrived, he was brutally beaten to death by some of the Jewish Sonderkommandos inmates uh, as revenge for what he had done to their children. All right, next. And I know I've got to wrap it up. I'm almost, I'm almost done. Right? Stacy, if you haven't taken your glasses off yet. Okay. Ross secretly photographed a, a crowd of Ludge Jews being ushered on a train um, onto a cattle car. And he, he described this as, uh, this is it's really quite fascinating. He said, quote, people with whom I was acquainted worked at the railway station of Radog, Rad, Rad, Rado, Radogosht, Radogosht, which was outside the ghetto, but linked to it and where the trains destined for Auschwitz were standing. On one occasion, I managed to get into the railway station, into the guise of a cleaner. My friends shut me into a cement storeroom. I was there from six in the morning until seven in the evening until the Germans went away and the transport departed. I watched as the transport left. I heard shouts. I saw the beatings. I saw how they were shooting at them, how they were murdering them. Those who refused to get on through a hole in a board in the wall of the storeroom, I took several pictures. And this is one of those pictures. Next. After Ludge was liquidated in August of 1944, 60,000 Jews and Roma, because there were some there were about 40, about 40,000 Roma or gypsies who were, had, were, had also been brought into Ludge. They were sent to Auschwitz, leaving behind their food pails. So as a personal aside, I just wanna comment on these food pails. Uh, about 23 years ago, my husband Dan and I saw related examples when we went to Auschwitz. Um, building after building with vitrines, piled high with suitcases, eyeglasses, shoes, human hair, children's clothes, and, and combs, personal items that Jews brought thinking they were gonna be resettled, and of course they weren't. And wrapping one's mind around numbers when it comes to the Holocaust is unfathomable. However, when presented with objects such as the one we're seeing on the screen, they bear witness to the suffering and the scale and the death of those who use them. They're personal and they represent humanity and they should move us. Ross and his wife were part of a cleanup crew of 877 Jews that were left in, in, in Ludge after uh, everyone else had been deported. True to their sick minds, Nazis were sure that the Jews had left their treasures in their homes and their table legs, buried in all kinds of places. And that's why they needed cleanup help. The Nazis had already dug a burial pit outside the ghetto where they had planned to eliminate the cleanup crew, but the Soviet army had other plans. Next, please, Hannah. In the fall of 1944, Ross knew that the Germans were shutting down the ghetto and fearing imminent death he buried, as I said, 6,000 negatives in canisters in a box that you see on the screen and placed them uh, in a wooden container lined, by, lined with tar uh, by his home. Then the Red Army uh, arrived in Ludge in 1945 in January, liberating the ghetto. And shortly thereafter in March of the same year, Roth, excuse me, Ross unearthed the box as you see in the slide, and about half of them had been severely water damaged, uh, but approximately 3,000 of them survived. And after the war, uh, Ross uh, testified at the Eichmann trial. He and his wife moved to Israel in 1956, and then five years later was the trial. And um, 
Henrik Ross died in 1991 at the age of 81 and photography absolutely saved him and saved his life. Next, please. Uh, there's the uh, slide of the Eichmann trial and the prosecutor holding some of Ross's photos. Next, please. And, um, and I love this image uh, that Ross took early on in his stay in the ghetto. Um, this inspires us as we see a Jew holding a Torah scroll, which is the most sacred of all objects uh, to us. And um, can we go to the last slide, please? As we think about Ross, and I've been thinking about how to close tonight, and I, I was so, uh, you know, it was just shared that, you know, the, the George uh, Floyd conviction, um, murder conviction, uh, happened yesterday. So as we think about Ross and his understanding of the value of documenting, of documenting history, uh, and his photographs serve as a reminder of photography's ability to create meaning. And when we compare him to today's world where we are bombarded with visual imagery, often of horrifying images, such as the brutal murder of a black man, uh, by, uh, by Derek Chauvin, it is profound that a teenage girl, Darnella Frazier, had the presence of mind to record George Floyd's unconscionable killing for all the world to see. And that act connected the crime to the rest of the entire world, alleviating our alienation because we've been so used to seeing these horrible photos from Africa, from Syria, from places all over the world where there's suffering uh, and, and hatred. And so just think what would have happened if the recording hadn't re existed. Well, I don't wanna think that long. This young black girl took a risk just like Henrik Ross and the consequences have been remarkable. Ross, whose mission provided plenty of evidence uh, of life in a Nazi ghetto displayed the complexity and range of his circumstances. We now see that photographs and the iPhone and recordings um, can change history. It did so 80 years ago, and it does so, it does today. As we honor and remember Henrik Ross, let us also salute Darnella Frazier for her bravery and for reminding us that it is our duty to stand up to injustice in any form. And I'll close with Ellie Wiesel. The late Ellie Wiesel spoke to this sentiment when he said, quote, I swore never to be silent and whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation, we must always take sides. So as we go about our daily lives after tonight, may we all be challenged to live like Darnella and be vigilant in the face of any and all kinds of racism. Thank you very much. Now we're gonna be inspired by the masterful translator of Abraham Sutskever, Stacy Goldring. Indeed. Cindy, that was, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it seems uh, both of us had our life-changing moments about capturing stories about the Holocaust when we were rather young. Uh, for me, it was babysitting at my cousin's house. Uh, after uh, my little cousins were all tucked into bed, I remember going over to a bookshelf and just clearly and pulling off a book <laughs> And I just started leafing through the pages. Maybe I was, I don't know, 12, 13, whatever. I remember opening the book and I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There were these black and white photos, these with piles of tangled dead bodies. And I, I, it was like a grotesque horror. I, I could not look away. Uh, and nor could I understand it. I could not, I couldn't put words to it. Uh, and I remember going home that night, opening the sliding glass door, walking through the backyard, hopping the fence and um, making my way in the street, across the street to our house and thinking, I'm not safe. I better be on my guard. And then a few years later, remember that TV series with um, Meryl Streep and James Woods, it was called The Holocaust. 
And that really educated America. I think that was like 78, 79 ish. Well, from then on, my identity as a Jewish girl was strangled, saddled, and twisted inextricably with these horrors of these images. I can't even pronounce. Uh, and, and what they represented. So anyway, that night, uh, it lit an urgency in me to capture and tr tell true stories of the effects of the Holocaust. And so that is what I do today with my pencil sharpened. And tonight also, it seems whenever we do these literature uh, events, Cindy, which are such a joy, I have always a confession. So tonight, another confession. It actually wasn't until 2016 that I ever even heard of Avraham Sutzkiefer. Uh, that summer, while uh, co-creating a course about memory of the Holocaust at the University of Florida, myself and two amazing professors, uh, doctors Rebecca Jefferson and Carolyn Rotz, uh, we were um, selecting just the right literary works to present to our students uh, through a course that we did at the uh, Isser and Ray Price Library of Judaica. It's, it's a beautiful sacred, sp sacred space. And I'm sure writers like, um, next slide uh, please, uh, like Primo Levi and um, Elie Wiesel and Victor Frankl come to mind. And Hannah, if you could switch it to them. Yeah, there you go. Uh, maybe some of these titles uh, look familiar. Uh, and I must tell you, I was in seventh heaven because I was tapping the minds of these great, super uber smart people, not only uh, Rebecca and Kati, but um, in addition, we tapped the English department, social studies, Judaic studies, or social studies, Judaic studies, and also the journalism department. Uh, so um, with the next slide, uh, we created an outstanding syllabus that did include Levy, but also Theodore Adorno, which you see on your right, and Paul Salon. And then we also had this poet, Avraham Sutzkiever, who we can see on the next slide. And um, by the way, I must say that the course was incredible and time permitting, I hope to bring it back to UF and other campuses because it is vital and relevant to uh, explore Holocaust education through art and the written word, as you see here on the screen. The written word, the poetry, of Avraham Sutzkiever, a man I'd never heard of. So I needed to do some research and I did. And you're looking at what stopped me dead in my tracks. I was reading and listening to his poem, A Cartload of Shoes. And I felt that I discovered a poet that expressed the ethos of Jewish identity as a result of Holocaust endured. Holocaust hyphen endured, one word. He gave poetry to the horror I felt looking at that book curled up on that sofa as a young girl on that Saturday night a long time ago. And surely more than one poet has captured this essence. But for me, Sutzkiever's body of work also addresses nature and resilience, all passions I have. So I wondered, how did I get to my 55th year or 56, I can't do math, without having known this man? And you may know him. He's considered one of the greatest Yiddish poets of this generation. But not to worry if you don't, because unlike novels, poetry seems designed perfectly for reflective revisiting. So today, we will honor Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, with the study of this poem, that according to the New York Times, evoked the nightmare of the Holocaust, unquote. So I'm gonna read this poem to you. And remember, it was written in Yiddish. So the translations vary. You may also find this poem called A Wagon Load of Shoes. So this is an English translation that you see here. A Cartload of Shoes by Avraham Sutzkiever. The wheels hurry onward, onward. What do they carry? They carry a cartload of shivering shoes, the wagon-like canopy in the evening light. The shoes 
clustered like people in a dance, a wedding, a holiday? Has something blinded my eyes? The shoes, I seem to recognize them. The heels go tapping with a clatter and a din from our old Vilna streets. They drive us to Berlin. I shouldn't ask, but something tears at my tongue. Shoes, tell me the truth. Where are they? The feet, the feet from those boots with button like dew. And here, where's the body? And there, where's the bride? Where is the child to fill those shoes? And why has the bride gone barefoot through the slippers and the boots? I, I see those my mother used to wear. She kept them for the Sabbath, her favorite pair. And the heels go tapping with the clatter and a din from our old Vilna streets. They drive us to Berlin. Now I'd like to deconstruct this poem to understand two things, its style and its message. Okay, um, I'm going to then share a, a brief biography about Sutskever, a man who wrote, fought and risked his life to save books and artwork, not once, but twice, despite death's barrel aiming at destroying his life. And then we will wrap, and I hope you remember Sutskever's story. Perhaps you'll be inclined to read his work or pen some poetry yourself. The rise of the viral disease of Jewish hatred can only be vaccinated with truth and knowledge. So be inspired by his bravery. Stand up to illogical hatred, just like he did. Okay, so now to decipher this poem, we must understand the symbol of shoes in Holocaust remembrance. So Hannah, if you could go ahead, maybe one or two slides. There we go. Okay, so in language, shoes, in this case, are an example of something that's called a mentonym. So that's a thing that represents a thing. So if I tell you I'm going to the track, you think horse racing, okay? If I say, oh, he's a suit, then we think of a businessman. And here's a beautiful book by Sloan Wilson, if you've not read it, analyzing the whole idea of the man in the gray flannel suit. When people think of images that capture the Holocaust, many see shoes. Next slide, Hannah. What do shoes represent in our poem? The Sutskever poem uses shoes to represent the collective whole for the millions of Jewish people murdered. The images we conjure when we read or hear about shoes triggers a reaction of the destruction of the body. These hollowed leather shapes of testimony piled as eternal witness to the pain inflicted on the bodies from which these shoes have been shed. The poem addresses the stolen identities and the individual collected identities of these individuals. Unbuckled, untied, these are trodden death masks, devoid of souls, souls, toes, and feet. Not only are these owners dead, but their bodies have been purposefully destroyed, bulleted, poisoned, burnt, gassed, buried, covered in lime, in mass graves, their carbon remnants polluting the skies, billowing from stacks of crematoria. Sutskever was considered a modernist 
and he was part of a new generation of writers whose style rejected the expected structure of poetic form. Holocaust poetry traditionally addressed with the style of lamentation or consolation. This poem is confrontational, questioning the reader, humanity, it, as if we too are collaborators, responsible for the unlaced leather crease voids emptied by the methodical banality of evil. Thank you, Hannah Aaron. This confrontational poetry dis destroys the expected norms of style. Further, the repetition of the questions emphasizes this entropic incomprehensibility of pure hate. Shoes, tell me the truth. Where are the feet? Unanswered questions, too big to comprehend. I would argue because the actions of human beings have outwitted us and our ability to use language to even categorize it. Hannah, could you go ahead to the slide of the individuals walking? Okay. What do these questions imply about the people who once owned these shoes? The feet from those boots with button like dew. And here, where is the body? And there, where is the bride? We know those who own the shoes, they had to remove them themselves. These shoes are witness to their last steps, recording as they were herded like cattle to their deaths. Where is the child to fill the shoes? Why has the bride gone barefoot? He is juxtaposing basic human events that we all experience walking, tying your shoes, running, dancing, saying I do, with this inconceivable idea that the shoes owners have been rendered dead. Cindy has shown us the images of Ross, Ross's carts. We hear the shoes rattle and throb along those cobblestone streets, metonyms of the murdered, Victims stumbling from humiliation, overwork, and murder. The heels go tapping with a clatter and a din from our old Vilna streets. They drive us to Berlin. Shouldn't ask, but something tears at my tongue. And here, the poem captures the universal rubbernecker in all of us, we don't want to know. We don't want to look, but we can't help it because it is such a destruction denuded of language. Next slide, Hannah. So who was Abraham Sutzkiever, poet, partisan, born in 1913 in a small industrial town located southeast of Vilnius, Lithuania. Next slide, Hannah. Not an ideal location. The Sutskevers were living in the settlement, the Pale of Settlement formed in 1791 by Catherine II, a region de designated for Russian Jews as indicated with the blue outline on this map. If you have heard of the term beyond the pale, it has its roots here, as Jewish people needed special dispensation to live beyond the pale. At the end of the 19th century, close to 95% of all of the 5.3 million Jews in the Russian Empire lived there. Next slide, Hannah. Four years after Avraham was born, the pale was abolished, but Jewish hatred was not. So the family decided to move to a safer alternative. They went north to Siberia. In Omsk, Hannah, next slide. Uh, oh, maybe it's not there. Um, seen um, in Omsk, uh, Abraham's father unfortunately died at the age of 30. 
So he left behind a young mother with three children. So in 1921, they moved back here to Vilna. And FYI, that is a track of over two uh, of over 2000 miles. In Vilna, his mother enrolled him in a cheder, which is like a Jewish elementary school. And then he went to a Jewish high school. He audited university classes in Polish lit. It was there, a friend turned him on to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and introduced him to the beauty of Russian literature. Uh, these were good times. This picture of me, people in the library, that is good times. Vilna was experiencing a sophisticated, vibrant, secular Yiddish cultural renaissance. And this library, the Strasham Library, boasted 45,000 volumes. The city earned the nickname, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. And it was here that the YIVO Institute was established in 1925 to preserve and study Eastern European Jewish culture and preserve it for the future, much like the libraries do today. Uh, next slide, Hannah. Uh, by 1939, YIVO, pictured on the, on the right, held a huge archive of manuscripts, correspondence, photographs, recording art, folklore, movie posters, more and more, tens of thousands of books, and among them, periodicals from all over the world. Culture was pulsating with brilliance and creativity, and it is in this rich atmosphere our poet begins to pen and, er and grow his wings, always flying and filling the pages with his own signature style. Next slide, Hannah. Although he was a member of the many writing and artistic groups, such as Young Vilm here, uh, their work lent itself towards the political, but Sutskiver followed on the expansiveness and oneness with nature and the cosmos, maybe influenced by Emerson. And thanks to Cindy, I know he was influenced by Edgar Allan Poe. In 1933, he published his first piece in the Jewish scouting magazine called Bin, and scouting was good to Abraham because it was there that he met his wife Freyke on a scouting expedition. In 36, he was discovered by the Austrian novelist Joseph Roth, no relation to Philip as far as I can tell. In 1937, his first book of poems is published and many of his poems, again, going back to nature. He was published in Warsaw and New York. And um, the next slide, is um, uh, a visual, an example of his work about his nature and his Siberian experience. And perhaps you can guess the, um, the illustrator uh, of uh, this work. Next slide. So um, Friedke and Avraham marry the day before World War II break, breaks out September 1st, 1939. After the Germans and Russian, Russians divide Poland, Vilna became known as Vilnius and it was absorbed into the Soviet Union. In June 1941, the Germans attacked Soviet forces in Eastern Europe and they occupied Vilna three days later, to quote our poet. And overnight, our thoughts grew gray. The sun sowed poison salt on open wounds. And you're looking at images here of the Vilna ghetto, divided into ghetto one and ghetto two, the smaller. This very June 22nd, it will be the 80th sad anniversary of this terror. More than 100,000 Jews from Vilna were murdered in the woods of Ponar, just outside of town. The 2,000 remaining were herded into the ghettos you see here and killed off through executions until the last of its occupants were deported or shot by September 43. So went the Sutskiver family into this hell. Avraham could hide for a bit in the crawl space under his mother's home in ghetto two for the infirmed, but he was found, arrested, and set to be executed 
but in Dovskyevsky style, the Nazis shoot right over his head and then sent him to work. Sickening. It was sick, a sickening summer for the Nazis and its Lithuanian conspirators. Now the smaller ghetto, Ghetto 2, was packed with dead weight because these people couldn't work. So they were fodder for the beta killing method of Jews that Cindy mentioned of these mobile killing squads. Now, I just want to speak to you for a brief moment about Lithuania's relationship with Nazi Germany. The Nazis used this country as a testing site to find the best, most efficient way to murder the Jews. I'm not going to go into detail here because it's too much for me. However, I did write a story about this that was published in the Sun Sentinel back in like 1995. And you can access the link that Emily can put in the chat. And it talks about Lithuania's eager collaboration, eager collaboration to murder the Jewish people. I know this because my husband is family is from Lithuania. And if you are living in Jacksonville, you know there is a huge Lithuanian population here, the Pushalotters and those from Panovish. And we allegedly went there to do a genealogy uh, adventure uh, and it ended up being an odyssey of complete hell. We did have some fun times, but I'm saying that I, I had no idea what was coming my way. And what was coming my way was a statistic. Before the war, Lithuania was home to 265,000 Jewish people. By the end of the war, 95% slaughtered dead. Next picture, Hannah. This is an image of some of the conspirators. And here we have Freiki and um, Sutskiver and some... Um, some really brave people. So how did Sutskever survive? He wrote poetry through his ghettoization, capturing Jewish culture and calamity that persisted. So just like Heinrich Roth's, Ross, even amidst death and destruction, or in spite of it, the photographers took pictures, the writers wrote, artists made art, actors acted, musicians composed. And the Vilna ghetto gained a golden reputation as the Jerusalem of ghettos. So despite death, life goes on. There was culture, there was theater, there was a museum, a bookstore, a reading hall, sports center, plays were performed. And while in the ghetto, Avraham and Freitke become parents to a baby boy. Jews tried to hide their babies but the Nazis would find them and poison or strangle them. They weren't worth a bullet. After their son was poisoned, Sutskever wrote, quote, I wanted to swallow you, child. When I felt your tiny body cool in my fingers like a glass of warm tea, I wanted to swallow you, child to taste the future waiting for me. Maybe you will blossom again in my veins. I'm not worthy of you. I can't be your grave. I leave you to the summoning snow, this first respite. You'll descend now like a splinter of dusk into the stillness, bringing greetings from me to the the slim shoots under the cold. Next slide, Hannah. Enter the Nazi unit called the Eisenstab Rosenberg with a mission to plunder museums and libraries for art and a future Nazi museum showcasing relics from an extinct race and utilizing Jewish books as resources of academic study for a planned Third Reich University. The Nazis assigned Sutskever and other writers, poets, intellectuals, artists, to catalog all these precious library and art collections. Can you imagine? 
this horrible position you put someone in, catalog it for a future sick world, or have it sent to the paper mill, or have it thrown in the pits with the dead bodies. You choose. Hannah, next slide. Within the ghetto, these archivists became known as the Paper Brigade. Now, some of these writers had worked at YIVO before the war. They knew the Germans would eventually destroy YIVO's collections. So they secretly placed rare materials together with the books and artifacts that they chose to save uh, before they were shipped to Germany, believing that although they would not survive, that maybe these precious documents would. They had hope someone would find the documents like a message in a bottle, but that's not all. Sutzkiever along with other Jewish intellectuals were also at the same time hiding and smuggling books and sculpture and paintings and artworks out of Vivo, out of the Nazis reach and hiding them all over town, some even making their way to New York. And they were smuggling in arms. He said, quote, books and tatters of text more eternal than marble, unquote, needed to be saved. How brave. Now who assisted him on this mission? Hannah, next slide. Well, if the partisan resistance song Zogni Kemo may sound familiar to, me, to you, and I apologize if I've botched the Yiddish. This was the anthem of the Vilna Ghetto resistance movement. Translated, they took the motto, we will not allow them to take us like sheep to the slaughter. These individuals were aiding the paper brigade and rescuing these precious books, art, and documents. And here are the words to their song. I'll just read you the first graph. Never say that you're going your last way, although the skies fill with lead cover blue days. Our promised hour will soon come. Our marching steps ring out. Here we are. Next slide, Hannah. Oh, and Emily, if you could put the link to um, that um, the, on YouTube, there's all these beautiful renditions if people are interested. They could find it on YouTube or if Emily can put it in the chat. Now, with the help of partisans like these pictured here in this famous photograph, Sutskiver and his wife escaped the ghetto through Vilna's sewer system on September 13th, 1943, making their way through Lithuania, now the Soviet Union, their dense birch forest, and I never ever looked at a birch tree the same again, surviving minefields. And he describes surviving these minefields by crossing with a poetic rhythm to avoid death. And just days later, the ghetto was destroyed and its inhabitants deported to their deaths. While fighting with the partisans in the forest, he continued to write poetry. And he says in the preface of leader, quote, poems uh, from the sea of death, unquote, when the very sun became like ashes, I believe with perfect faith, as long as poetry does not abandon me, lead me, lead me or not destroy me, as long as I live my life as a poet in the valley of the shadow of death, my sufferings will merit tikkun, repair, and redemption, unquote. My message to you, Never underestimate the strength and inspiration that comes from putting pen to paper. Next slide. Talk about strength and resilience. This man did not stop. Connecting Stalin, Dr. Zhivago, James Bond, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, and I would even argue Mark Twain. For example, Stalin and Dr. Zhivago and Bond. 
His 1943 poem, Kol Nidre, which refers to one of the holiest nights in the Jewish calendar, made its way to Moscow through this resistance network and it gained the attention of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. Led by poet Ilya Ehrenberg and Dr. Zhivago author Boris Paternak. They implored and advocated at the Kremlin with Stalin for a Sutskever rescue operation. And so it was. A plan was executed and a rescue operation engaged with a plan airlift in an airstrip out in the woods in Russia to extract the couple. And would you believe it or not, the first plane crashes. So a second one is sent, transporting the Sutskevers, ferrying them to Moscow. And you see this picture here next year. There's the family Sutskever with their daughter, Rina. Still, Sutskever's work does not stop. Determined, like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, but this is for real. A month after we see their daughter here born, he wrote the first official article ever printed in the Soviet Union detailing the murderous atrocities of the Nazis as witnessed by Sutskever. Hannah, next slide. Um, it should be a slide of Pravda. Now, I don't read Russian and I couldn't find the exact edition, but here is an example for you of what Pravda looked like then and where his article would have appeared. In addition, after the war, he served as a witness in the Nuremberg trials. He wanted to give his testimony in Yiddish, but he had to deliver it in Russian. Hannah, next slide. In the Jewish faith, it is customary to stand while reciting Kaddish, which is a prayer honoring loved ones gone. So if you watch the Sutskever Nuremberg trials, and there is there, there's several, just go on YouTube, you can find them. You will see that Sutskever, he stood for the entire testimony. So what happened after the war in relation to Sutskever? Of the 60,000 Jews in Vilna, only a few hundred actually end up surviving after the war. The next slide shows the, shows the ruins that the paper brigade and the resistance fighters were able to retrieve and exhume. Hidden literature, artistic treasures, all secreted away, including etchings of Chagall and Theodore Herzl's diary. You may have seen the film, The Rape of Europa. Well, like the monument men, next slide, we have our monument couple of Mr. and Mrs. Sutskever looking over rescued treasures delivered to Moscow. And if you look at the uh, image on your right, you will see Sutskever on your left. And in the cart, there is a bust. And that my friend is Leo Tolstoy. Today, uh, many of the uh, materials now are in Nivo in New York. Much of it did remain in Lithuania and was only discovered with the fall of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Interestingly, in the 1990s, they were still discovering hidden pieces. Uh, there is an excellent book called The Book Thieves. Uh, by Anders Reichel. It's a great translation. And the story I'm telling you this evening is just one of many about how the Nazis tried to rewrite history by hijacking and commandeering our precious books and destroying them. Hannah, next slide. Oh, there's a copy of the book. Okay. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, Sutskever and his remaining paper brigade friends had to rescue the books yet again, when then the Soviet Union decided that they'd have a turn in narrating and writing their own history. And they were bent on sending everything to the paper mills. Finally, in 1969, in the photo uh, you see here, I call this Sutskever, my Mark Twain. Here he is in Israel, 
seated second from the right with his surviving partisan friends. And I am almost sure they're speaking in Yiddish. See, Sutskever emerged after the war as an Israeli national poet and is considered one of the greatest Jewish poets of the 20th century, responsible for influencing a Yiddish revival. And if Goldie Lansky is with us this evening, her dear cousin Aaron of the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, probably would have a lot more to say about our hero, Sutskever. Now, this was no easy task, reviving a language. You must understand that language is what holds together groups, countries, identities. And Sutskever, this man did not fit into the mold of the pioneering Israeli Sabra. As Zionism took hold in Europe and Jewish people made their way to establish an autonomous state free of threat and hate in Israel, they wanted to leave their old ways behind. But in Israel, Sutskever remained a fervent advocate for Yiddish as an integral part of the Jewish people's expression and identity. He assumed a public role with the message that Yiddish language and culture would continue to thrive and will hold the Jewish people together. But Yiddish was seen as old school. Next slide. Sutskever would say au contraire, or maybe he would say that's Gornish. Shedding the old ways, really though, isn't it a normal part of growing up? These young pioneers decided that Hebrew should become the language of the new Jewish home. Now, if you've watched Netflix, the, the, film, the uh, series Shtisel, you will see, or if you listen closely, you will hear that the characters are speaking Yiddish and they curse the Zionist heathen Israelis that dare to speak Hebrew, which the Haredim, these very religious Jews portrayed in the series, reserve only for sacred prayer. But way before Shtisel, we had Sutskever. Next slide, Hannah. So today, Sutskever's works are translated from the Yiddish to English, Swedish, French, Hebrew, Polish, etc., etc. His wife died in 2003, leaving him and two surviving daughters. Sutskever passed away in 2010 at 96 years young. I want to wrap and go back to a cartload of shoes. Remember, we discussed the symbolism and the term mentonym. Look at your own shoes. I bet your shoes right now could tell a lot about you. Piled in the cart to which Avraham refers, he sees the pile, probably forcibly collected and loaded and then dragged through the ghetto by imprisoned, imprisoned laborers as a sociopathic sick stunt by the Nazis. We learn in this poem what shoes represent, but it doesn't end here. Sutskever is also a reporter. He is truly reporting on the murder of his own mother who was killed early on as she was in ghetto number two. So today, I like to look at this program as an act of remembrance, a way for all of us gathered to give our own original act of Kaddish and remembrance to Avraham's mother and all the murdered who had mothered, who had mothers. And isn't that all of us? The shoes and poem stand as a cautionary tale of what hate can do to humankind. Thank you. Cindy. Stacy. Yes. Fantastic, as usual. You know what, I haven't looked at the, um, the chat, but I, I see it scrolling and I wanna thank people uh, so much uh, for attending. Uh, I want to also uh, thank uh, Hannah and Emily and Kara 
and Carrie and Andrea and everyone at the Comer. Yes, for, thank uh, you all. Yeah, just thank you so much. Um, and um, Cindy, do you have anything you want to uh, wrap before we before we go? I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I think it was pretty comprehensive. I mean, I Suitskeeper, I've, I have a whole new appreciation of Suitskeeper now. I mean, and myself, what a life. Myself, Ross. You know, there is this book we could recommend also to people, um, Memory on Earth, which has all of the Suitskeeper uh, photographs. And of course, uh, the book, uh, the book, sure. theme. of course, I'm always going to recommend right. book. Right. But um I, I hope know. we did Holocaust Remembrance uh, proud, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I just want to thank everyone then. And um, I'll take us out by saying um, we appreciate you being here as your own act of remembrance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.